Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Recently, this channel has been discussing the hydrogen phase diagram and the interaction of atoms like lithium with the metallic hydrogen lattice. Now, when considering the hydrogen phase diagram, the question naturally arises, what is the total pressure above the solar photosphere? In the standard model, that pressure is thought to be a very small fraction of the atmospheric pressure experienced on Earth at sea level, namely one ten thousandth of an atmosphere or less. The question is, does this make any sense? Are such low solar pressures above the photosphere reasonable? The answer is clearly no, yet the solar astronomers are quick to claim that they have measured the pressures so they must be correct. In fact, they have never measured the pressures. They estimated the pressure values using models and the analysis of spectroscopic lines. In this video, I will briefly discuss why such approaches are flawed. The analysis of solar atmospheric pressure from spectroscopic lines can be traced back to the work of an Indian astrophysicist, Meghna Saha, as one can learn in these two classic papers linked below. Saha believed that the Sun was a gaseous plasma. As a result, when he considered the ionization of an atom like calcium, he was only concerned with temperature and pressure. He described the first ionization in this manner, and then wrote down this expression to characterize the problem. Note that X represents the fraction of the atom which is ionized, R represents the gas constant, T the temperature, P the pressure, and U1 the energy of the first ionization. Saha considered that his expression was valid under conditions of thermal equilibrium. Note that this reaction is endothermic in nature, as it requires energy to be added to the reactants. Saha also advanced expressions for the second ionization, for instance, when calcium loses a second electron. He would obtain this expression where now Y represents the fraction of the second ionization and U2 the energy associated with it. In his second paper, Saha presented this table for the first step ionization of helium. One immediately sees that the ionization increases with temperature. Ionization is also favored by lower pressures. As a result, if temperature was known, then clearly the pressure could be established by noting the extent of ionization. Saha's work received worldwide acclaim by the astrophysics community. Saha initially believed that the pressure of the solar chromosphere was in the range of 0.1 to 1 atmosphere, much like the atmospheric pressure on Earth. This was based on consideration of spectral line widths and shifts. Later, these estimates were revised, especially when Fowler and Milne re-examined the chromosphere and brought the pressures down to the 10 to the minus 4 atmosphere level, as one can learn in this paper. Unlike Saha, who had considered the minimum amount of material needed to form a line, these authors examined the point at which lines reach their maximum level in the stars as a function of star type. Irrespective of atomic species surveyed, Fowler and Milne obtained an electron pressure in the 10 to the minus 4 atmosphere range for the chromosphere. The question appeared to be solved, at least if one considered that the only reactions of importance were simply ionizations occurring within a fully gaseous atmosphere with no interference from condensed matter. Yet things were actually not as clear as astrophysics publicly portrayed. In fact, Harold Zirin made the point in his famous text on the solar atmosphere. Zirin recounts that the Saha equation predicted that there would be much more iron-14 in the corona than iron-13. Yet in reality, the intensities of these lines were nearly identical. Here is an important quote. On the other hand, we observe that the abundance of the two ions in the corona is nearly equal. The L-word ionization theory, which counts up the actual detailed processes in the corona, shows that the two stages of ionization are indeed equally abundant in the corona at a million degrees. So the Saha equation is off by a factor of a hundred trillion times. He goes on, although errors of such magnitude appear ridiculous, their existence was discovered only in the last 30 years, and the Saha equation is so convenient to use that one may still find it occasionally applied in the current astrophysical literature to problems in the solar atmosphere, where it gives errors of factors of millions. According to Zirin, the issue is that the Saha equation was designed to be used in conditions of thermal equilibrium, and no such conditions exist in the corona. At the end of his book, Zirin writes, 
For some years after the discovery of quantum theory and the Saha ionization theory, astrophysicists were ignorant enough of the problems of non-equilibrium thermodynamics to use these formulas blindly to calculate and explain everything. In fact, they discovered many things which might not have been found at all had they been less rash. But many errors were also made, and one has only to look at the many discordant calculations of emission in the hydrogen lines and others to conclude that there is little to be gained at present from these interpretations. Yet despite all of this, the Saha equation is still taught in every graduate text on solar physics, usually without highlighting its problems. Beyond the need for thermal equilibrium, another hurdle for the Saha equation and all such approaches is that the correct answer can only be obtained once the system has been properly characterized. For instance, relative to the ionization of calcium, one cannot just write down simple equations such as these. It is very likely that the situation in the chromosphere is affected by additional reactions. The calcium ion is not simply being produced by a combination of temperature and pressure to release a free electron, as Saha theorized. Rather, it is very likely that calcium is involved in this kind of chemical reaction, wherein a hydrogen atom is first captured by calcium to form calcium hydride, which then transfers a hydrogen atom plus an electron to a condensed hydrogen structure, as I discussed in this paper and presented in this video. Such reactions will also result in the production of calcium ion and the associated emission lines, but in this case no free electron was ever released. The electron was transferred with the captured hydrogen atom. Such reactions represent the most reasonable means of accounting for the emission lines in the chromosphere. These lines indicate that we are dealing with exothermic processes in this region of the Sun. The emission lines were unlikely to have been produced by random processes, as the standard model advocates. The possibility that condensation reactions exist which lead to chromospheric emission lines places into question everything we know about electron pressures above the solar photosphere. Solar physicists are incorrect in their calculations because they have failed to properly consider the phase of the Sun itself. The body of the Sun is not gaseous, the photospheric surface is real, and condensation reactions in the chromosphere should be considered. Condensation reactions are exothermic. The emission spectrum of the chromosphere is best explained by considering such reactions as we saw in this video. The chromosphere is known to possess structural elements such as spicules and rosettes, again as we saw in this video. The pressures above the photosphere are likely to be in the range of tens of thousands of atmospheres, and this further helps to explain the presence of type 1 metallic hydrogen on the surface of the Sun. The photospheric pressures and densities are not those of a vacuum. The Sun has a mass which is about 300,000 times greater than the mass of the Earth. It is reasonable to infer that the solar atmospheric pressure will be many thousands of times greater than that of the terrestrial atmosphere. Material is moving both away and towards the solar surface. There is no thermal equilibrium as required by the Saha equation. The reactions in the chromosphere are exothermic in nature, not endothermic as required by Saha. As a result, all current calculations relative to the solar pressure at the photospheric level are invalid. Well that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.